phones weren't working for some reason as soon as TikTok went on. So I don't know what was going on as soon as we were live because they were Yeah, that's a good time to figure it out, right? Yeah, so, <laughs> but now, well, no, they were working. And when I was on the live, just me, um, I had che Chelsea check that the, uh, she could hear me and it seemed fine. Um, but uh, when you started talking, I couldn't hear you. So, oh, that's good. Do you have any guess? I, I currently have none. Do I have any any what guesses? No guess, like or people guess. watching your stream. Oh, um, I had one. It looks like we have five right now. Okay, then we did it! Yay! Yeah. Welcome yeah. to the live, everybody. Yeah, it does a weird thing we when six. you split. When you decide to split. Rather than be in the guest box, I don't get to see any of your statistics. So I have nobody idea if anybody's here. Woo! All right. And I can't read their comments, Jasper. Seppi, so just am, so you I know. Am luring, I am luring them with the hint of chest hair. Whoa. It is, it it's, is a a it's a thirst trap. Thirsty Wednesday. Right? Yeah. After the food poisoning, that's what people really want to think about. Like, <laughs> Oh, my God. It was... It's, it's my least favorite. So for anyone who doesn't know, um, who doesn't sort of watch all of my TikToks, which I understand completely. Um, <laughs> we, uh, we finished a Kickstarter last week. And Congratulations like, right, for Not Hunt. Yay. Uh, and it was a big success. Uh, but I decided to take a couple of days off and then sort of like get back to it um, early this week. So Sunday rolls around. Uh, I'm at a friend's barbecue. And it's like four o'clock and my stomach is just cramping and oh no go home barely make it home i'm up all night with food poisoning oh and no so, yeah so yesterday was just like i was like better but i was just like i'm not i'm not i didn't make like i had a couple things that i had to get done yesterday because they're like time sensitive um, yeah like i had, but like other I, the non-time sensitive stuff i was just like i am I'm not doing it. Like I'm, I'm going to lay here and listen. I wasn't even watching anything. I laid on my couch and listened to Harry Potter on tape for like. A day. <sighs> I think that's the best <laughs> therapy uh, advice I've heard in a while. But all right, that being aside, let us start the victory tour for the Nut tour. Hunt at the beginning. All right, for those of you who don't, don't know, today is a special how you wrap up your Kickstarter episode. And for people who want to become experts or learn this whole process, the, the end of your Kickstarter starts with the beginning of your Kickstarter. So, how uh, far that's not out? Clear, the end of your Kickstarter starts months before your Kickstarter. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're saying the same thing. We're on board. Yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah. So, when... All right. I always talk to people about their communication plan or their business plan. The very first thing you know it's real is when you lock in and on a date. So when did you lock in on your date for launch and for end? So, yeah. So I, al I always knew that I wanted the Kickstarter. So I didn't always know. But I wanted the Kickstarter to be well wrapped up ahead of Gen Con um, because okay. my thought process was that I wanted people to be able to pre-order at Gen Con, right? And we have another game that we're planning on launching um, in February, uh, another Kickstarter. And so I wanted to have Nut Hunt wrapped up before Gen Con so that we could, All right. you know, pre A couple pre of things. Yeah. Let, let's talk about that. All right. So um, before we move on, I feel like as a person who's done this multiple times, um, your Kickstarter, during your Kickstarter time, you should be working on your Kickstarter. Unless you have somebody else backing you up, you should not be doing other activities. Yeah. And when you are at a convention, you should be at a convention. Yes. And so Jasper's wisdom for having late backing be a thing during Gen Con rather than trying to run a campaign while doing his first Gen Con, that wisdom should be applauded. Sometimes I get things right. Um, and what's you got it right. Yay. What's interesting is, so the Kickstarter had a ton of wins, right? Like a ton, a ton of wins, but also a lot of things where I'm like, I could have done that better. Right. And like a ton of lessons learned. Um, so, I mean, I think the timing uh, was fine. Uh, so the timing of when the campaign was, I do think that there was a little bit of like a weird summer slump right when I launched um, Featherstone Games, um, Joel Bodkin, um, he, he's had two or three successful Kickstarters already, and then he was launching his next game on the same day as ours, um, and it failed to fund. 
And it's also oh, no. sort of like, yeah, his is like a little bit lighter weight, like a little bit younger family weight, um, but still like sort of family weight game category. Um, and so that was really surprising um, and sort of like, I think that, you know, it was right around Origins. I think there are a little th- couple things I could have done a little bit better on timing. Um, but yeah, I sort of knew that I wanted the Kickstarter to be done by the end of June. And then when we did it, at first it was going to be a May Kickstarter and then things just take longer and it just sort of gets pushed, gets pushed, gets pushed. Um, okay, June ended up this is wisdom number two. I'm going to annotate wisdom by Jasper as we go along and to give him a chance to breathe and adjust his guts because we're all post like, you know, like thirst trapping. Uh, all right. Okay. So if you're not ready to launch and nobody is particularly wrapped up in it, you, it's okay. As long as you're communicating clearly the why and how of your changes to people who are expecting it, don't feel bad about having to make adjustments along the way. You're like, for this reason or that reason. But had you announced the date and then pushed it back? Or had you just secretly like, oh, here's my goal date. Uh, we're going to have to push it back. Uh, well, so I was telling yeah, I was telling people May or June for a long time. and then I like that. And then like a month ahead of time, I was like, it's going to be June. Um, and then I was just telling people June. Um, I did mess up a lot on timing. Um, so not just uh, like, it's just a fact. So like, here's, here's a prime example of just like me being a bonehead. Um, so I wrote a guest blog post for Jamie Stegmeier's blog, right? Um, yeah, that's great. Which was awesome. And, and you're I, like, I'm going to write a family fa- friendly title that is as spicy as possible. So when I send my thirst traps, everybody's confused. Yes. Um, <laughs> so... <laughs> So, so, I, so, so Jamie was like, so I wrote an article for Jamie Stegmeier's blog, right? Um, yeah, that's and, great. And I wrote of that guy. I wonder if he's any good. He's great. And, and um, he gave me, and so, you know, I, I wrote it in, so I, I think it was like May or April, the, the article went live. Whereas I should have had it go live during mid-campaign, during the campaign. And one of my big mistakes was that, I overestimated the amount of retention of sort of engagement that a lot of like these pre-marketing efforts would have and would carry over onto the campaign. I sort of overestimated that like that life cycle of people seeing who we are and then being interested and then when they see it again sort of coming on board. Whereas I think a much more powerful strategy is like getting eyes on it when there's a buy now sort of button. And just things like that were like, you know, I think our website got like 700 page visits because of the article that I wrote for Jamie Stegmeier's blog. If that was 700 more eyes on the Kickstarter, you know, maybe that'd be 50 more backers, which is like pretty meaningful kind of thing. Um, so like I, just things like that, like there, I definitely, I, I definitely wouldn't applaud me on timing. Um, although like, you know, there's other things that I, you know, we obviously- I'm gonna applaud you on lot, right? learning and recognizing Jasper. It is okay to make mistakes. It is okay to rectify mistakes. What is not okay is to make the same mistake over and over and over. So again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you the applause. That is great. Uh, a communication plan. When you are figuring out your Kickstarter, you should think about a uh, day-to-day level of, okay, this is what we're going to talk about. This is the audience we're going to hit. And you want to keep in mind, uh, <laughs> I'm calling you out, Pat. Uh, and you want, to, you want to keep in mind that, like Becky and I talked about, that you need to get in front of a person 9 to 12 times before they recognize who you are. And if you somehow do get their attention, giving them a meaningful call to action or CTA at that moment is the goal for every communication beat in your uh, Kickstarter. So, yeah. all right. So, you're doing all this aw- aw- awesome content marketing. A little bit of like, oh, I should really time this and use this ammo for the campaign. What did your communication uh, plan look like for the Kickstarter? So, uh, I didn't have a great plan, but... Um but that's another sort of lesson learned for the next one because I think that during the campaign we actually had very successful engagement and communication, um, and it was a little bit uh, fly by the seat of my pants. And I now have a better idea of how we should 
approach that's it where you're wrong who's even wearing pants in this day of age everybody only needs shirts <laughs> <laughs> Sabi, I, your your camera angle if you're not wearing pants is pretty close pretty i close like to wear dangerously jasper um, uh. so so uh so we actually had uh this are, this is pretty remarkable um i think so we had uh 1232 backers um we had over, that is amazing yeah we had oh over, my gosh we had over 700 comments on our campaign page by one person? Wow, no. Pat, you really got to work. No, we it re <laughs> we really so here so so here's something that that is sort of important to think about with Kickstarter is um, yep. dis your discoverability on Kickstarter is algorithm driven. So you have the audience that you bring in, but then you have um, the latent or, or nascent um, population on Kickstarter who will discover your campaign through browsing and and just through their algorithm. So. Who sees it is determined by the types of games that they like and what's similar, things like that. But it's also determined by sort of like these momentum factors. So uh, the momentum factors, the big one is obviously funding, right? So if you fund quickly and you fund to high levels, you will stay on that front page for longer. Um, but also like number of backers matters a bit and comments on your campaign page matter. So what we realized is that by engaging people you know, we were on that front page or on those first two pages for a couple of days. Um, I think if our dollar amount that we charged per game were higher, we would have gotten a larger early boost in funding. We would have been even higher for a little bit longer. So another lesson learned there. We should have charged mm -hmm. a little bit more. Um, but we thought engaging with our, with, with our community was really important. So, you know, we told people like, you know, engage in the comments, ask us questions. You know, I even put at the end of our updates, like, remember, commenting improves, increases discoverability, right? Like a little thing like that so people know. And then yeah. mid-campaign, um, we did things to actually directly drive commenting and engagement. So uh, we offered free wallpaper of the game art. We have amazing game art, so we wanted to show you it do. off more. And yeah. so we offered comment on the campaign page with your favor of these six illustrations, and we'll send you a phone wallpaper of that illustration. Or... Aww share the post or share our campaign on social media and you get all six, right? Wow. And so it's like this little thing where it didn't cost us any money. It was like a fun thing for people to get engaged. We got to show off the artwork and we got 700 comments on the campaign page. I think that there was only- That's amazing. There was only one negative comment on our entire campaign. And that was someone complaining that they didn't think- All that right, we were no, gonna... before, you say, before you say that, too you know, it, often- too often do people, creators and content creators, and people we do, fixate on the negative minority. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So instead of giving the actual comment, what was the lesson learned well, no, from a, it? It's and a we win, can move though. On. It's a win, though. This one's a Is win. Is it? Yeah. So, 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 they, so they were complaining that without a, uh, an insert, a plastic insert, they thought there were too many components for them to want to buy the game, and they didn't think that we would hit that stretch goal. Oh. Our our supporters came in saying that, you know, that I've, I'd been reasonable, like I had adjusted stretch goals along the way so that, to sort of excite people, to sort of energize it so we could get there, things like that. Um, and also, like, so we had people come in and sort of defend it. We had another, some other people come in and say there's tons of value here, like this game should cost more, which it probably should, um, even if you, you know, even without that. And yep. then, Seppi, we blew through that stretch goal. Nice. So, so, uh, so, like, it's it's one of those things where, like, I mean, and and so that just goes like. And then they still unbacked in the last day. Oh, and they did. Stuff. They did. They did. <laughs> I told I checked, you. I checked, and they did. I yeah. told you. Let's not focus. Everybody here in our wonderful land of TikTok, and you know, I have. Uh, I hope Becky's still here. Is it uh, uh, Marcia and Cinda, or is it? Uh, Marissa, I always get uh, the two of their names just I like from the the board game group. They recently, out of the blue, I was like complaining about how expensive it was. It's Marissa, mm -hmm. or is it Marcia? <laughs> That's the same same name, different pronunciation. Either way, uh, I was complaining about trying to get those prototypes together for a component-heavy game to send to reviewers. Yeah. 
Marcia. All right, I'm going to get that. I just keep on Marcia. I love the two of them. Uh, and I, you know, I am the Kevin Bacon of uh, careers, Jasper. Yeah. If you name an activity, I can tell you exactly how many steps from it I've been with my own career. All right. Um, all right. Uh, how about um, astronaut? Astronaut. Very good question. I did uh, a photo shoot for uh, a doctoral thesis on which uh, was using actual NASA data for computer programming. Okay. All right. Does that count? I think that's All one right, step away from an astronaut. Hey, that is we, one we, step. Before we move on, um, Austin over at Games with Austin had a question um, earlier, but I want to get to it. Um, asking about, I mentioned the February Kickstarter. Um, yes, our second game. Uh, we are planning a, we're planning right now a February Kickstarter. I think we'll get there in time. Maybe March if things get pushed a little bit, but the plan is early 2023, right after Nut Hunt fulfills, give it a couple weeks and then launch our or, second game. Or do you want to team up with me and help me with my Kickstarter, which is in October? Do you want to combine forces? We'd be like Voltron. I'm going to talk about you about this later, Jasper. You'll love this. Uh, so, Yes. We are talking about making things happen, and we are talking about today's topic, which is making your Kickstarter happen. And Jasper is giving up gold, which is think about the algorithm of Kickstarter or whatever crowdfunding platform you're using and figure out what drives it. And if you can do that cost effectively, which is fun for everybody, that's a win. And yes. so his 700 comments for the Kickstarter is one of the ways he finished strong, which is today's topic, okay? Again, I am high on the TikTok community on board games. Uh, Marcia and Cinda helped me with my prototype for Conquest Princess, which is coming up so by making for stickers you, for me. So here's a question What's that? for you. All right, so, so prototypes is a whole, is a whole thing. Um, yeah. And they can be a pain in the butt. Um, and huge. Huge pain in the butt. And I actually found, so our prototypes, I used, um, I, I had a hard time getting wooden meeples cut to size and the right colors mm -hmm. in the U.S. So I ended up mm -hmm. using like acrylic, um, acrylic six millimeter thick acrylic meeples. Um, but I think it lost a little bit of sort of like the nicety of having um, eight to 10 millimeter thick woodcut meeples that the final game will have. And Let us talk about this. Yeah. This is an opportunity, not a mistake. Okay? Yeah. When you assure people that there is something better coming along and let them know that there is a vision, when you do the other beats in your communication cycle and you draw attention to this, you will get more leverage out of following through. This so is my done, experience. Like, if I had done like the first stretch goal, like a mini stretch goal that's like wooden meeples instead of acrylic meeples, it would have made people excited? Maybe. I'm talking okay. about beats with like getting these prototypes in front of uh, reviewers. Yeah. So here's so I who had, might be looking at the thing and yeah. going, okay, I hope these are better well, so in the I actual have, game. What's interesting is, is a number of reviewers, most of reviewers just didn't mention it. A couple of reviewers were like, I know that this is going to, like Quackalope, for instance. Jesse and Wes did a review. I um, did a really nice review of Nut Hunt. Um, and Jesse, and it was like, and I know for a fact that these are going to be thicker wooden meeples, right? And that's an exciting thing. We had another reviewer, though, poo-poo on the, the prototype components, um, even knowing that it was a prototype, which was a little bit uh, disappointing. Um, but so here's my question. For that you. is an opportunity. Okay. Don't have, like, you got to let people be, like, one of the awesome things about, again, about TikTok is you got to let people be what they be. Like, right now, no one has hit on my side of the screen, so I only have nine likes for this. Yeah. But you got to let people be who they are going to be. I will solicit for these likes, by the way. Uh, and then you're like, hey, this is an opportunity for a dialogue. Yeah. And when you come back to that reviewer, when, you, you know, you get them an actual copy of the game, then they yeah. will... Uh, they will have to rescind their earlier comments. Or oh, when you see them at Gen Con, if you have a nicer version, these are, this is a, this is a thing. Don't take, again, like the one person who backed out after bombing your thing. Yeah. It was, I mean, it was this weird. Is, it was weird. So, they I, don't, so, yeah, don't, so here's like, a question for you, it, though. Because here's another question, yes. right? So you probably know within 
two or three who your manufacturer is going to be for your game, right? Yeah. Like you probably pretty good. Three. So yeah. why not pay a little bit more and get production production prototypes made? You can. Right? Like you especially should. if your campaign isn't until October, like that seems Where like that a, gets complicated is when you have multiple stretch goals when um you're still figuring things out and you yeah. need to get things to people before the Kickstarter time window. Yeah. It gets complicated. In an ideal world, you would like to have everything nailed down uh beforehand to get it to them, right? Yeah. But uh, that's a lot of cash, a lot of time, a lot, and yeah. a lot of go-ahead. And sometimes you're in the spirit of actual Kickstarters, like you're figuring things out as you're going along. Having a good idea and a good track record helps, yeah. but sometimes you have to do that kind of stuff. But what I really want to say is, don't, like your first reviewer, the positive one, who's like, I know, don't underestimate the value of aspiration and people's belief in it. And sometimes people will be more excited about something that they can't see than something that they can. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, okay. So I mean, your yeah, communication plan was a little yeah. loosey-goosey, but you had an amazing, co like... Uh, engagement strategy that's called an engagement strategy okay. folks you, you had an amazing engagement strategy with multiple hooks you're like okay please do this thing we'll give you a thing we are now in a transactional relationship for folks in general people want to participate in a relationship where they're giving well, and getting so Seppi, that's the most so value part of, part of this is so part of the play the plan the strategy like it evolved as it went like it was a it was a, a week into the campaign when I was like, oh, we can have wallpapers, right? But something that I had day one that is going to be hard when, you know, our next campaign comes and it's bigger and our next one after that and it's bigger is I messaged every single backer individually within, you know, like half a day of, of them backing the campaign. Um, and a lot of them, like if you just had a name and no picture, then it was just like sort of what I was sending that day, like the same thing. But if you had like a dog in your picture, I'd talk about the dog. If you had like a piece of art, I recognize. Like I wanted to make sure that people knew that like, this is actually me. I am want to interact with you. Like if you're from Germany, I'm like, hey, I had an internship in Germany. Like I was right down the street. Like I wanted to engage with people so they knew that I was there and caring because I really cared about everyone being there supporting us. And I think that that went a very long way. Um, I think that I don't, you know, not most people didn't respond, obviously, like, but, you know, I like I think like the people who the relationships that I built through building Pine Island Games and then through this Kickstarter, like I've built lifelong friendships. Right. And just that personal connection and being able to interact with people and talk to people is my favorite part of having a, what this you couldn't do this as a hedge fund manager jasper is this not like this is it wasn't that interpersonal. <laughs> so there was so surprisingly there was a good amount of interpersonal relationships that matter um in finance um you like you you do build like if you're buying you know if you're buying bonds from someone like so i wasn't really buying bonds i did invest in corporate debt but it wasn't like buying a lot of bonds whole different thing i won't ramble on that okay um but you do yeah. you do have relationships with like your traders your salespeople. You do like build some friendships, but it was never the same type of relationship or friendship that I feel like I'm building through a passion, right? Um, like through, so here, here's, dude, here's, here's, this is crazy. So our second game, um, our yeah. second game is called Sigil. It's a two player. Oh, before game. we talk about Sigil. No, this this all right, but this What is, like, is the plan for fulfillment? We cannot talk about oh, sigil for, yet. For fulfillment? Oh, so for fulfillment. What's the general oh. fulfillment wish? Yeah, so uh, like one is As it is communicated it now, no spoilers. Oh, as it's yeah. communicated now, it's, you'll have it by the end of March. Um realistically, I think it'll probably be January. Um basically, either this week or next week, I'm sending uh Mejai uh our our money. Um, sort of before we get it out of Kickstarter, because this is another thing, like, because the campaign wasn't huge, like, it was really good, right? It was 1,200 backers, $42,000. Um, but the actual 
dollar amount, you know, it wasn't a two hundred. It wasn't a hundred fifty thousand dollar campaign where I don't have the money on hand that I can right. pay for manufacture. Right. So, um, so I'm going to send the manufacturer. I'm going to put the order to manufacture before we get the money out of Kickstarter, before the yeah. price manager opens, before any of that, um, just to sort of accelerate it. Um, all of our files are proofed um, already. Um, yeah. Um, okay. Are- so for everybody to understand where Jasper is continuing to do good things, he's accelerating the delivery date and he's accelerating the delivery date, hoping it will bring a lot of fun and good love and packages before his next Kickstarter launches. And I also just think it's right to do right by people, right? Like, why? Cause yes! Here's, here's, here's another thing. Here's a, here's a, a personal... I, I don't like to poo-poo on people, which is the second time I've said it this, in this interview, but, but I'm going to for a second. I don't like it when... I personally don't like it. After your kids. after your time with like food poisoning, should you be <laughs> like mind. even thinking about poo pooing? Because I don't want you to um, discover that you're so, still not wearing any pants. Because that's G- all very dicey. TMI. It was the other kind of, of food poisoning. Um, <laughs> I, TMI. I, TMI. I don't. I don't like it when when campaigns are are opaque about where they are in development. Um, and are opaque about how much of the process is left for them to get this game to your hands or even sort of finish finishing the, the, the illustration, finishing the, you know, if they just have like a, foot, a footnote about like, we're still writing lore, right? Like, I don't like it when, when, when because it, it uh, 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 Bridie on, on TikTok, she had a whole thing where she backed the game and it was like two years later and she still didn't have it. And the issue Ouch. isn't that the issue isn't that sometimes it takes that long, right? Frosthaven spent two years, right? But the issue isn't that sometimes it takes that long to get a game into your hands. The issue is is that consumers don't have a good idea about whether a game is like a Seppi Yoon fight in the box game and is ready to go to print that instant, and you can get it. <laughs> In, and you'll get it in a reasonable timeline versus a game where they're raising money because they only have half the illustration done and they, have, they haven't even like finalized like iterating on the rules. And that's fine if Kickstarter is being used to fund project development, but I don't think that Kickstarter does a good job communicating with the consumer over where in the process these different projects are. And I think it creates a lot of ill will when a publisher sort of underperforms expectations and then it makes it harder for future publishers to sort of raise money for their project because I, people have a bitter taste in their mouth. We need to t- talk about this. As someone who uh, I'm very uh, excited that your project was a success. It sounds like you're ready for another one. It, it is the job of anybody who uses any of the cloud, crowd fla- uh, crowdfunding platforms to understand they have impact on other people who are doing the same. People see Kickstarter as a store, and you wouldn't go to a store that took your money and didn't give you a thing. Yeah. They do it's not a, see the people as individual it's things. It's a shared ecosystem. It is a shared ecosystem. Once you, like, burn somebody, you've taken them out of that ecosystem forever. Yep. Right? They'd have to do a lot of stuff to get that person back. And, so, and there are flat out people who say... I cannot do Kickstarters or I will not do Kickstarters. Now, my number one uh, uh, piece of advice for people who are looking to do Kickstarter on the regular is treat Kickstarter folks as their own community. It's really tempting if you're uh, at a lot of conventions like myself or in retail places or whatever it is to treat uh, Kickstarter people as part of these other groups. You should instead treat them like their own separate group of people, people who like to enjoy games this way Mm -hmm. and taking it as a mindset of, oh, I need to do this for these people because they would be very excited to comment here or they expect, yeah, have these set of expectations for pro- uh, projects they like, uh, is a really, really good idea for how you get things done. Would that you agree sense. with that, Jasper, now that you've experienced it's it? It's not something that I had thought of, 
Um, and also, like, you know, our company is a lot younger than yours. We don't Why? Have... Are we fighting? I've never said this before. I've clearly said this before. And to you. But, like, I, I, didn't, I didn't internalize it. Um, I don't have a lot of experience with consumers buying our games not through Kickstarter, because the only way that we've sold them is through Kickstarter at this point. You um, will, it, Jasper. You it makes will. Sense. It makes intuitive sense. Um, oh, I want to circle back, because I think this is, this is something that I think is really, really cool and sort of shows the power of creating goodwill and engaging with people. Um, so I write a blog uh, once or twice a week, usually twice a week, but uh, once or twice a week. Um, and it's on sort of- You quote dubious sources for it? I did, I did quote Seppi. I did quote Seppi. Um, so, um, and, and I'm active on forums. I'm active <coughs> engaging with people. I try to be a part of these communities. Um, so we're, Bless you. Sorry about that. Bless you. So for our second game, um, it's a two-player dueling game that we thought would port very well to a digital application because two-player well, dueling games often do. You have, you know, Magic the Gathering, chess, like these games Star are Realms. really, yeah, these games are very good two-player dueling on on digital port. Um, oh wait designer, a second! You did say the M word. Are you going to the thirtieth anniversary for Magic in Vegas? Um, I, I didn't even realize that it was the 30th anniversary. I went for the 25th. I was at the 25th anniversary. Um, okay, so this is a major fail. I'm going to have to tell, like, you are a hardcore magic guy. And the fact that you did not know that this event, like BlizzCon, the, is the, up and the happening. Past, the past six months, I have been pretty unplugged. No, from... I don't think this, I don't think this is, this is, this is, this, you as a person, this should have filtered to you already. That's fair. This is a failure of their media because you yeah. have obviously been on media a lot in the last four weeks. Yeah. And the 25th anniversary, uh, it was a GP. It was uh, Modern Masters 2, I believe. And it was a blast. It was, I think there were like, they end, they end up doing like two GPs. Uh, GPs are like a couple thousand people tournaments. So it's really cool. Um, went down, it was the same weekend as like a music festival. So that was kind of funny because it was like us nerds. And then like everyone in like their, they're like, like, uh, you know, there's, there's skimpy bright wing. Where was that. it? Oh, it was, like, it was oh, in Vegas. Scandals. It was in Vegas. It was in Vegas. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All um, right. So this is again going to be in Vegas. The people who are, uh, who run PAX are putting it on. Okay. Uh, the people who are running their events asked me to come and be a booth babe for their event. I'm like, you guys have a real problem. Like. <laughs> so if you end up going let me know yeah i'm excited um all right okay, so, go on so um so we're doing a digital port for our game the designer of our game is the developer at google and so as sort of like a passion project he was like i'll do like i'll i'll i want to code this up he had like a part it partly done already so he like coded up the whole back end of of this of this game um, we needed a front-end developer. So I put out on the blog, uh, we're looking for a front-end developer for, you know, this project that we have. I get an email um, from this... That's not a euphemism. No, no. Uh, a front-end <laughs> front front dev is the person who does the your your, U, UI, your U, UI interface, right? So so does sort of how you interact with the program. Um, and yeah, no, sure I get it. I, get it. I, was, I was in software as a service. I, you know, yeah, so um, we should... Use the use terms. Uh, yeah, go on. Yeah, yeah. So a front end developer does everything from like making sure that a, a website will show up on a phone and on a computer screen fine, <laughs> making sure that the buttons click, that it looks good, like all of this stuff, making sure that it interacts with the back end. The back end is like the, the brains of the program. So I so Matt is based in Australia. He emails me. He's like, hey, I this is what I do. I'd be interested in and you know working on the project. So I. I put him in touch with our, uh, with Andy, who designed the game, who works at Google, and he gets back to me and he goes, "This guy is one of the top five in the world at what he does. <laughs> he, he has written he has written articles on how to do the types of implementation that we actually need." And That's I was like, "Amazing!" And so I and so part of uh, sort of my thesis with the company is that I want to have the best people on board, so that you know we have the possibility for hitting those home runs. The expectation is most of the games won't, but I want ah. the possibility of having, but no, the expectation is I want the possibility. I'm buying, I'm, I'm looking to bring the best people on and do the best development that we can so that we have the optionality of selling, you know, the hundreds of thousands of units. Right. Let's like, talk about this. For, 
for the stream, I want folks yeah. to internalize this if they're interested in it. Kickstarter is a hit driven economy. You are looking at making the biggest biggest success that you have. And even if your your fans come back for, let's say, Simon's latest uh um cyberpunk game, right? Mm -hmm. Still, like it's a half a million dollars. That yeah. is, you know, and it's got its own problems. So, but for anybody else, that would be an amazing, like, incre incredible project. But, not for, but yeah. for them, it's not $3 million, and therefore, it's not a hit. Yeah. So, our thesis, yeah. though, my thesis, though, is, is that, like, I want to, this, like, to, to, to publish games professionally and, and live a comfortable lifestyle yep. doing that. And there's a couple ways yep. to do that. I'm tangenting, but there's a couple ways to do that. One of them. First is of all, don't live in New York City. It's yeah. Um, I want. To, well, here's the thing. I want to do it in New York City, Seppi. So this is where the strategy is coming from. I want you got to make a lot more money, Jasper. You got to well, make exactly. a lot more money. Well, so here's here's the thing. So one of the ways to do it is you can have sort of serial, serialized releases, right? Right. Um, my strategy, and like you know, we will continue to publish games, but my strategy is I want to sort of in finance, it's called buying optionality. And basically what that means is you are making an investment so that you have a shot at an outsized return. Now, if you're buying optionality, like if I buy an option, if I bought a call option on a stock that I thought was going to go up, it might be that three quarters of the time that option expires worthless, that you don't make any money, right. out, that you lose whatever money you invested. But you're making that investment so that you have the chance, that one in four chance of making a really outsized return. And so the strategy right. that we're approaching with our games is we're putting a lot of money into development for our games. We're bringing on you know, the best graphic designers we can find, the best illustrators we can find. We're doing everything that we can so that we are buying that optionality so that when one of our games hits, everything is there so that it could blow up, right? That's sort of like what... Now yeah, I think this is very important uh, to talk about as sort of a big educational moment. Uh, VC or venture capital has this pattern, everybody. We're going to go a little bit deep down into to, to finance. Let's yeah. say there's 100 projects, and there's of that 100 projects, 25% of them are going to fail. They're just not. They're not going to make any money. It's, it's a total loss. That next 25%, not going to make its money back. Still a failure, but you're going to get some amount of money. The next 25% up from that is going to be, you know, make 1x, you know, make its money back, maybe 2x. And then above that, you've got your 3x. And even yeah. those 3x people we don't really care about, it's those 10 to, uh, you know, those top 10% who, who are making yeah. 10 to 200x the initial investment that then fund everybody else down. And so people line up, they're like, okay, we see all these things being equal. We don't know this kinds of stuff. We're going to take a chance on all these things, thinking that these, these outliers, these, these people that are far out, are, we're going to have a, a mega hit. And that's obviously, that logic is very important for people to understand as far as how money like, is transformed in these like, super, like, oh, my minimum investment is a $5 million investment type groups. But also for Kickstarter, you are doing that as a publisher. You are picking games and projects going, <gasps> with not that same option. You're like, in a hit of uh, economy, you cannot take, like, you know, one in four, you know, making zero money. It will crush so many small game companies. I mean, that's that's our strategy, though, Zeppi, right? Like, that's, and like, <laughs> that, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm being honest, right? Like, I mean, like, I, and like, look at, you can, uh, some of the mistakes that I made in the on Kickstarter were that I spent money on things that I thought might buy optionality and that in retrospect didn't, right? Like Facebook advertising was like a, a disaster for us. It was a zero, negative 100% return on our investment, right? But I spent real money now, on it. Uh, that's a good comment. Like folks should know that that changes a lot and Facebook advertising uh, uh, affects a lot by the approachability of your project and total funds in. Like there is an argument for too big to fail. And um, I've seen some numbers in uh, for and not during this year. 
this year is a bloodbath. Everybody's uh, multiplier is going way down with, with Facebook advertising, especially on the lower end. Yeah. It, is, it is very hard. Yeah. But, uh, but some of these big properties still putting enormous amounts of money and surprises into yeah. and getting the kind of returns that they want. But go on. Yeah, and so also our, our strategy isn't just through Kickstarter. Like ideally you will have huge no. big Kickstarters, but like, you know, I, I look at Viticulture, had like a thousand backers in their first campaign, right? Now it's sold over yep. 200,000 copies, right? Yep. That is um, the sort of like grand success that I'm talking about. And it doesn't all have to come through Kickstarter. And that's the type no. of optionality that I'm trying to buy with our games, right? So like if we put an extra five or $10,000 into developing a game to get it like as perfect as possible, and like that means that our Kickstarter goes from it would have been break even to we're losing five or $10,000, like that sucks, but like that's okay because I'm trying to buy that chance that we have these huge hits. And also in games- Yeah, Mouse Cheese did not make it into the black until after the second month of retail. Okay. And also with, with, with board games, uh, like book publishing is you have a back catalog effect where once you do have one of those outside successes, that will flow through to all your past games. Um, one of the most successful things of our last cam campaign was making our catalog be available to new people who are discovering it. And that was very good. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so I'm trying to find the best people. So when Matt got back to us and, and Andy was like, dude, this guy's one of the top in the world at, front, at what he does. Um, I, Yo, I, Sigil! Um, yeah, so I wrote, so I, I talked to him and I was like, look at as long, so we had a call on like what we need for the project. And I told Matt, I was like, look at like, as long as you sort of come back and it's not like an egregious number, like I want you on board for this because I know that you are the perfect person for this role. Oh, um, and he's not, you know, it's, he's doing it on top of his normal job, right? It's not like this is his right. income as working for Pine Island Games, developing a, a online board game. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so, so he comes back to me, and I don't want to like disclose exactly how much he's charging, but it's probably like no, a no, fifth. No. It's probably like a fifth of what he should be. It's like it's it's a pittance compared to like what I expected him to ask for, because he's had he's had interactions with me. You know, he reads the blog when he when when he backed the Nut Hunt campaign. I messaged him, and we had a short conversation, like. Because he's been involved and had positive interactions with me as a human being and appreciates sort of what we're our vision for the company and what we're doing, he wanted to be a part of one of our projects and is giving us a huge amount of value. And like, look, I'll do it. I'm going to send him. That is amazing. But it's game, so amazing. I'm going to stop you, Jasper. Yeah. I'm gonna stop. I'm, it's so amazing. I'm going to stop you. He's talking about this in a roundabout way. But what Jasper should be saying is. The connections that you make, the investment in your community and one-to-one -one relationships has real payoffs. You are uh, investing in the end. People see that you are spending the time. And maybe that person just has a better day because somebody cared out to reach them. But then some other people want to participate in a community that they feel uh, uh, is aspirational in a community where they see, feel seen and to support people that they believe in. Yeah. And there's a lot of ways for that to come about. And honestly, we need some positive, I'm feeling good about everybody else thing. I cannot say enough nice things about those stickers and those tokens. It's a t tiny thing, but it really is a big deal. <laughs> um, <laughs> but David now go on. David Akrena has a question um, before I go on. Um, Asking how, as a new publisher, do I justify uh, this sort of model of, you know, buying optionality and sort of burning capital in order to buy that optionality for our games? Um, so I, when we launched the company, we had a couple of choices, right? One of them is, you know, a, a lot of people will publish board games on the side of their normal job, of their regular income, right? And if that's the case then what you're probably aiming for is like, of course you hope that you'll have that game that is an outside success and you very well might, and that would be amazing. Um, but what you're probably doing is you're probably trying to figure out ways to not burn a ton of money, um, which also, you know, I should be doing, but not, but to not burn a ton of money to hopefully sort of break even and get something that you're proud of out into the world so that people are playing it. 
That's what a okay. lot of people's goals. Jasper May is making an important point. But also realize if you do not spend it, it in capital, in cash, you are probably spending it in a different way. It can be opportunity costs. It could be time. It could be sweat equity. All right. And I'm going to explain those three yeah. things. Yeah, <laughs> opportunity cost. Opportunity cost means I miss my window for the most possible uh, return on what I'm doing. Like for, for fighting a box, it was I should have launched my Kickstarter uh, uh, in 2011, not 2013. I can almost tell you how much money I lost because of that, that reason for end of the line. Flat out. That's just the thing. Uh, time it. Money has value. The marketing is changing. Like uh, the fact that I did what Jasper said with mouse cheese and I had all my files and money to my printer in advance meant my job was already queued up and a priority. And it got on one of the last boats before COVID shut down the world. Right? Yeah. Uh, and then the last one is sweat equity. Sweat equity is I am just going to burn personal time, overtime, my time, you know, quote unquote free time, you know, or time at an inexpense for the purpose of, of uh, pushing this project forward. I am a slave, <laughs> I'm not getting paid to this individual thing. Yeah. Also, uh, Pat said something in my live he wanted to talk about always leaving people with feeling good that you interact with them. That is something that everybody should embrace. Uh, even if someone doesn't like your game when they demo it, they should have a good experience with you and want to try uh, the next thing that you have. You can give a person a good experience without them necessarily thinking they need to buy your game. And that has value as well. All right, um, Jasper. So yes. we explained all those things. Now yes. continue. So I think, so, I mean, this is, this might just be like, I want to, I want, you know, I live in New York City, right? I want to turn board games publishing, a board games publishing business. You know, I have luckily the savings that I have some time to get this off the ground, but I want to turn this business into the equivalent of a six figure salary, right? Like low six figures. Whoa. Like that's my goal. That's my goal, right? That's my goal. It's not there yet. Like we aren't making money yet, but my goal is, yeah. is to over a couple of years, turn this into uh, the equivalent of a salary where I can live a comfortable life in New York City, right? Like that's not nice. out what my goal is. Now, to do that, a strategy where I'm putting ten thousand dollars into each game and publishing a couple games a year, or you know, let's say sort of a, a low, a, a, a lower capital investment, high turnover company, I think that would be very, very hard, right? So the way that I'm the, the, the Chelsea and I decided to approach the company is that we're, we're willing to do less games and every game that we sign, I, in my head, and probably none of them will do this, but in my head, I'm like, I could see this game selling a million copies, right? Like I could see a path. Like, that's the thing I could see, like, for instance, so not hunt, I could see not hunt being like, you know, obviously like this isn't the expectation, right? So like, I'm not trying to be like, to, to pretend like it is or be like full of hubris. But like I, the reason I felt really confident about non is because I was like, there are people who, who we played it, who, who played the game and they told me this is my favorite game. Full stop. Aww. Right. And, and the, it's, it's a, it's approachable. It's sort of a family weight gateway game. Right. So like you can play it with like, you know, your nine year old kid, but also like gateway gamers could do it. It has a mechanism that's like very novel that like isn't really in other games. So it's distinct enough. And I could see it being like a katan for a lot of people. Like I think the road to getting there is extraordinarily difficult. And I think that, you know, in the first stage of that, I'm already looking at sort of like missteps I made with like the Kickstarters where it could have been bigger to get into more hands. But I'm sort of in this place where I'm like, if I can get this into enough hands, there's the potential that it could be a really big hit. The same with Sigma. All right. You are looking to be a publisher of big commercial successes. Yes. Which means it needs to be approachable. It needs to be well executed. It needs to have an idea Buttoned of up. it that other people can transfer to somebody else easily. It needs to be okay. so, and it has to be buttoned up. It has to be impeccable design, graphic design, great illustration. Like, I'm trying to, I'm, it's like, 
It's one of these things where it's like with the If you want to make a wing, you want to sell as many as Wingspan, you need to be as buttoned up as Wingspan. 100%. That is exactly yeah. that is exactly the approach that I'm taking. And because like look at like there is a downside. There is a there there is the downside case that 18 months from here I'm like, you know what? I have to go back and get a corporate job and support oh, my no I'm like that's not the oh, that's God. not oh my that's God. not and like there's oh, nothing God, the thing it is, burns, it burns. I wouldn't personally I don't I wouldn't personally want to do that I was not sort of like content in my former career which is why I'm trying this career but without taking the capital risk to make these games as good as possible I don't see another pathway to getting to the type of sort of like sustained no, lifestyle I, I, no, I that like, I want off of I, publishing I, games. I like what you're saying for the math reasons. I think that that is great. Okay. I'm going to I'm going to devil's advocate yeah. why I I'm much worse at this than you are. I don't know <laughs> I, mean, so, I mean you're so far you're not, right? Like that's not... Uh, like all right, so uh Conquest Princess is coming up. Um, since we're talking about Kickstarter, we're we'll talking about mine that's coming up hopefully in October, maybe a little bit after, but that's our, our goal date for, for that kinds of stuff. And I've been talking with people trying to get how approachable, like how big is a title that is, uh, it hopefully appeals to women and gay people, but everybody. Uh, and in particular, when it's an everybody title, often or not, uh, people think that the gameplay has to be uh, much more accessible and less difficult. Conquest Princess is mind-meltingly hard. Mm -hmm. And uh, at Origins, as a small subset of people, we had 48 tickets available for our events well, so uh, for an unknown by, title. By, by mind-meltingly hard, do you mean mechanically or do you mean depth of strategy? Like, is it hard to learn? Yes. And, okay. Yeah, okay. Okay. Because those are very different things, right? And I think no, that no. there's a, have you right? Have you played Mouse Cheese yet, Jasper? No, you never invited me to. We were supposed to, you were supposed no, to be over. Oh, you need to come you play You were supposed Mouse, to be over Mouse last Cheese. week. Mouse the, the Cheese. The mechanism that happens in Mouse Cheese, the, the game mechanics are very simple, but the strategy is mind-melting hard. Okay. Uh, I like that as a theme. Yeah. So... Uh, Conquest Princess, the core mechanics are easy, but there's an optionality to cards and specificity that make its okay. interactions more difficult yeah. to a magic level. So I think that that's, uh, I think, yeah, I think that that's though a little bit of a different type of, yeah, because that's, because like, that's not, yeah, I mean, I think that that's fine. Because like, if you're, because so you don't have to grok all of this at first, you get to see what these cards do and how they affect the game. Hopefully you so don't, and not, that's one of the play testings. But it is also co-op. I would not okay. make a game this hard that was competitive because that means the person who do it does understand it versus doesn't understand it, that's they're going to have two different right. experiences. And that's like too both many being bones, negative, right? Too many bones right. is is a game that is way too fiddly. But because it doesn't matter, because you're you know it's like oh we got this wrong, but everyone like, it doesn't matter, right? So that's right because you're on the that, same that side. Works. Yeah. So we had 48 people, uh, 48 spots for an unknown title. And all we did, we didn't a really advertise that. Maybe in our newsletter where, where and then uh, where, Origins. This is, this is that Origins, okay. Right. Origins. We got 39 people to show up for the, the events That's over great. the weekend. That's great. We had 100% people say that they had a good time playing the game. Okay. Of 39. Yeah. Uh, you know, we marked it down. Was okay. great. Was we great also got, an option, or was it this like, or was good the highest? Did you have a good time playing? Yes, yes or, no? or no? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Answer the yes or no question. Okay. Boom. Then the next question would be, uh, are you somebody who kickstarts games? Uh, again, simple yes. So next was how much money you would want to pay for a game with this level of gameplay, and then would you how, like free how stuff? How polished was the prototype for that third question? The, how much uh, better than it was not as good as it should be yeah. I, I can't stand up too far so i don't want I anybody to give me a my with nut hunt my inclination is that like part of the reason a couple two a couple things one i i probably should have charged including shipping about nine more dollars a game for it like sort of sort of realistically um i think that would have sort of been a fair price but i was trying to give our kickstarter backers sort of as competitive a price as i could um 
I think that I grossly overestimated the elasticity of demand. I think that consumers on Kickstarter are much less price sensitive than I assumed they would be. This is after like talking to people and also after fiddling around with like showing off in our headline image that it's only a $35 base pledge, right? Like it didn't move the numbers right. at all. Um, if anything, I think that sort of pe makes people think it's cheap and it cheapens it a little bit. So I think I should have charged right. more for it. Um, I also right. think that when talking to people when they're playing a prototype version, depending on how polished it is, people are always going to sort of compare things to sort of like their impression of like a discounted rate on like a, you know, on like a discount online retailer. And also they're going to compare it to like what they would want to pay, not what they actually would pay. So like, I think like, at least that's my impression just with one yeah. title. I love, I love what you're thinking. And I agree 100% with you, what you're saying. Let me continue on with the story yeah. and see yeah. how you feel about this map. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We had almost a two to one ratio of women to men for the event. Okay. In an environment. But they didn't know it was uh, called Conquest Princess. It was an oh, they did. Un oh, they did. Okay. Do you think oh. that that was? Oh, yeah. Okay. Do you think yeah. that, that was fashion why Fashion is power. They... Conquest Princess. Fashion is power. No, I mean, do you yeah, think absolutely. that that Because I would, I would imagine the Origins is two-thirds men, probably. Like, I haven't. Been, it is. But, In right? an so environment that's, that's two-thirds men, I had my events being two-thirds women. Okay. And of the 12 events that we did, guess how many succeeded in mission one? Uh, two. Two! The answer is two! They all lost my, like, spectacularly. Only yeah. two people made it, one of which I was playing in. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that's fine. Yeah, I think with the co-op games, that's fine. Um, yeah. So the statistics for that is, am I able to transfer those statistics to have, a broader wait, do audience? Do you have difficulty levels that you can crank up and down in the game? Like, can uh, you offer yes, an easy mode for your first game? Yes, we're trying a couple different things. We uh, First of all, there's a mission zero, so you can learn the mechanics. Just a learning yeah. mission, I think, will make it more fun. Number okay. two, have you ever played Agricola? Um, I actually haven't, no. I know, I okay. know Agricola, but Have I you played Calverna? Played. Yeah. Okay. So you know that they have decks based on uh, complexity for a level of learning. Yeah. And so we will probably have the first, uh, like the, the, the learning decks will be powerful, but very straightforward fashion items. Okay. You can use iconography and you understand, if you understand the basics of the game, the weird, like, you know, it's like in magic, it's just a creature that is mana efficient and is beefy yeah. for its mana cost. So wait, so the players that, have that their would own, be the kind of the players have their own decks in this game. Is it sort of like a, a living card game? No, okay. that's that's a good idea. But no, they share fashion because fashion is power, and they collect fashion items to create efficiency of actions because it's co-op. Okay, okay, okay. You'll like it, Jasper. I'm, if you're, yeah. if you're, so if your whole squad has the same aesthetic, are you more powerful? It's funny that you say this. If your whole squad, uh, one of the mechanics that makes this game weird is friendship would be magic if it wasn't copyrighted. So you can share all the, the suit functions, the fashion items that you have. If you're in another square as another agent, you can use their suit functions. It creates an interesting compound effect that you are... Uh, thinking about where you need to end versus where you need to, the other person begins, where normally, while simultaneously, the game is trying to pull you apart and doing everything in the different directions. Okay. And so it is really good. It is the smartest game. I, Mouse Cheese is fantastic. The most elegant game I've probably written is probably Hedgehog Cop. But <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> this game, it, it's really good. But the point for this Kickstarter is, I made very strong editorial choices for what is probably potentially an art house project. Like this is a this is a game for the person who needs this in their life, who needs to learn to love again. Like yeah. and it will inspire them. But it I is mean, not I, I know, like I'm, the commercial I'm well, going so, to so be I able think, to live in New York. So so I think that like I think that I think that we're talking the same language, but I think that we're, I don't think that like, so Not Hunt wasn't designed to be like 
this mass market commercial game. It was like designed to be a great game. And then it was like, oh, this could be a big mass market success because I think it has a lot of those things going for it. And I think that it looking, really... it looking like Catan yeah. doesn't hurt its prospects, no, it Jasper. It I think it's great. Yeah. I think um, it's a thing. You're like, oh, I understand yeah. this weird thing. Like if you had never seen it before in a world, there is no Catan. You see, they're like, but now in a world like this, like, oh. Yeah, I will try this out because I'm not afraid of it. That's why there's forty thousand versions of Monopoly. Yeah, right. Yeah. So also though, Bisabi, I think that for like a new title to be successful, like it does have to be very distinct. And I think having a game that's like, like so, Not Hunt does that because like it's this environment that's very distinct and it has this fox mechanism that makes the gameplay feel very different than anything that I've ever played before. Right. Like it feels very distinct and unique. Um, and, and then, thematically, you feel and thematically like, you feel, like you're, you feel okay. it. You're like, oh, I'm trying to nest and I'm pushing the, I'm the fox is pushing everybody around and, yep. and then everybody gets eaten. No, no, that's yeah. a different. <laughs> yeah. No, they don't get in here. Um, I actually have, so I know that we don't have a lot of time, but I have, I have, we have zero time. Okay. So maybe I won't, I, maybe I won't go off into another, another whole topic. No, you should wrap up and talk about okay. your next steps and why okay. you're awesome. So, all right. So, uh, next steps. Um, Nut Hunt is uh, so Nut Hunt. We have a couple of fulfillment partners lined up. I'm deciding between two in the U.S. Uh, we have our manufacturer lined up. We're coming through very soon uh, with with that, that getting produced. Um, the big question is is how many units do I print? Um, because you know how many do we really want to sell? And then once we sell those, the question is, do we just go and do another print run, or do I do a small expansion, which I have a great idea for a small expansion, and do another Kickstarter? Um, and then also while all this is going on, um, we have Sigil, which is, uh, the gameplay is all there. It's currently an illustration and graphic design. Uh, we plan to have, uh, we have a digital version coded up right now that I can play with people and show people. Um, but we're doing more to it. We're build building in a ladder match with like Elo rankings and like all this stuff. Cause it's like a, com a competitive game. Um, so I will be around asking people to come check out. Uh, the digital version of Sigil. We're going to be looking for alpha testers. We, we're going to want to test the pipe. Ooh, like, is that one of those your Gen Con CTAs? I don't know what a CTA is, but um, maybe. Call to action. Oh, CTA. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. We're going to be asking for <laughs> alpha testers. Yeah, we're going to be asking. So we want to test the pipes <laughs> with alpha testers. Um, so if you want to be an alpha tester for Sigil, um, drop me a message. I'll make a video about it. Drop a comment there. Um, and I, because we need alpha testers to make sure that like the pipelines work. We're actually doing usability studies right now um, with with a friend who is a clinical psychologist and wanted to do usability studies on the digital platform. So we have like a small group of people doing usability studies the next couple of days to make sure that like the onboarding is smooth. Um, nice. Yeah, so so not hunt. That's by, great. By end of Before, March, like. As, as someone who wants to be your friend, before you make your final decisions about how many to print and why, yeah. I would love to be a fly on the wall as you talk your, yourself through your business plan for the next X number of copies of Not Hunt. Yeah. yeah. I think that is the most responsible thing I could do. And the best way to wrap up, your Kickstarter has ended, like thinking about what, how, like, what you do with the rest of the copies that you print is the core nightmare of people who have I uh, just finished a Kickstarter that they do not realize will haunt them for the next amount of time. Yeah. And that is what I will be leaving with you with today. All right, folks, everybody, you did a fantastic job for sticking out. Next week, we have the return of Danny Standring as we warm up for Gen, uh, Gen Con. And so she and I are going to chat a little bit about uh, having too much to do and not enough time. Uh, we're going to talk about how the people who watch F1 might be a cult. And we're going to talk about how her husband, Todd, looks great when disc golfing. So that is the topic for next week. Otherwise, the, we're going to talk answer, a lot more the answer, to, the answer to all of those when it comes to Danny is coffee. It's all coffee. It's, it is coffee. It's coffee. Too many bones time. coffee from, yeah, it's all the time. All right, folks. Thanks, Jasper, so much for being our guest. Uh, lots of great nuggets for people to share. And as always, thanks, everybody. And I hope you have a fun week gaming. Bye, everyone.